Our next speaker is an adjunct scholar at the Mises Institute and a faculty member at Mises U. <clears throat> and I always hate to point this out, but he was born the year after I graduated from high school. So he's one of our one of our young guns. In fact, I mentioned Mises University uh, earlier today, and uh, he was in the class of, of 2000 and 2001. So you can see the product of, uh, of uh, the Mises Institute's work uh, with our next speaker. He has a Bachelor of Arts from the Hillsdale College, PhD from NYU, and uh, worked for Laffer and Associates. Probably should have something clever to say about that, but I'll just let it pass. He runs a blog called Free Advice, which I think is curious because he never wants to do anything for free. But uh, he is the author of The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism. We have all of these, by the way, out, out front. He wrote Study Guide to Man, Economy, and State. Uh, he wrote the Study Guide to Human Action. He wrote a dandy little book that's out front, um, if they haven't been sold out, called Chaos Theory. And his latest book is very topical, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. Please help me welcome Robert Murphy. Thanks for that uh, kind introduction, Doug. I, I should mention that you know he's sort of lamenting the fact that I'm so much younger than he is. But actually, when I was in high school, I had about as much hair as he has right now. And so, uh, you know, there's sort of a, a give and take there. Um, I uh, now I, I realize it's a little bit tricky here. They've uh, we we drew straws, and I get the one I get to go after lunch. So I know you're all sort of you know dozing off, and I'm supposed to talk about business cycle theory and things. I, um, I actually am a sword swallower, and I thought that would be interesting to keep you all uh, interested, but the TSA didn't want me bringing those things on the plane, and so just, you know, an another reason to be mad at George Bush. All right, so uh, it's a little, this, and this part is actually true that the, uh, I had, you know, my, my speech in mind, the things I was going to talk about, and we actually, the speakers, don't coordinate beforehand. I mean, I could see what their titles are. But I mean, it's, it's true that a lot of the stuff I was going to hit, the previous speakers have talked about, the, you know, talking about how what they did during the Depression is very similar to what's going on now, given the explanation of the Austrian business cycle theory. Uh, so you know, I, I had toyed with the idea for a little bit of variety. Maybe I would get up here and give you the case for Barney Frank. Uh, but <laughs> in retrospect, I think maybe what I'll do is just try to you know, say the same themes, but maybe with a little bit of, uh, of a twist. Because um, I, I know actually talking to some people that some of you, as Doug mentioned earlier, may have been dragged here. You had no idea what you were getting into, and you're just, you know, saying, looking for the exits right now. Um, and also, some of you aren't really, uh, I, you know, as I say, I, I talked to some of you, and people are telling me that you know, I'm, I'm new to this. I, I don't know that much about economics. So a lot of what I'm going to say is a little bit of a repetition, but I think it'll, it'll be useful because this really is important. Uh, I've, I've noticed just in terms of writing articles for, for Mises.org, and again, for those of you, I'm sure most here know what we're talking about, but if you're new to this stuff um, or if you're hearing me online, the, uh, where all this stuff is available is Mises.org. And really, there's just a whole wealth of, of information there, not just daily articles that, that take the news and translate it you know, through a, an Austrian prism to show you this is what's really going on. And um, because just to, to let you in on a, a secret, the stuff that the, the media tells you that's actually not correct, right? And, and so, I mean, a lot of times just they're actually saying things that are just simply untrue, but, but more often than, than not, what happens is they'll report technically true statements, but yet the spin they'll give it, and a lot of times I think the reporters aren't even aware of it, is just completely backwards. Um, just to give you a recent example, they, uh, there was a, a, a poll that just came out, I, I don't know, I think it was Gallup, but I could be wrong about that, saying that right now, um, Americans, they, they were asked you know, to rate, the, they're given approval rating for various federal agencies, and the Federal Reserve got a lower approval rating than the IRS even got, right? And so that, I mean, if you think about it, that's kind of impressive, that you know, somebody could say, I actually dislike you more than the, than the IRS. Um, and so, I mean, in that respect, I think Bernanke has been doing a good job. And <laughs> I 
And, and, and this is also true. Uh, it sounds like I'm setting up a joke, but I'm not. This is true on the airport on the way here, uh, or in, in the cab, sorry, from the airport to the, to the hotel yesterday. The, the cab driver, he was, I don't know, I would say late 20s, and he's, he was real chatty. And normally, I'm extremely unchatty, or I don't know what word you would use, but yeah, I'm, the, I'm the guy on the airplane. When you say, hey, how you doing? I like open my book, and I just go like, oh, leave me alone. Um, you pretend I don't speak English, that kind of thing. Um, but so anyway, this guy was just so talkative, that, and you know, we're in the cab, so I was like, okay, I have to reciprocate, so I'm, I'm not completely antisocial. And so we started, and he's like, what are you doing? And he dragged it out of me. Because most people, when they say, you know, oh, what do you do? And I say, I'm an economist. They just like instantly fall asleep. <laughs> but, and so I'm very reluctant, you know, to admit this stuff. So, but he's just dragging it out of me. And so finally I said, okay, yeah, I'm going to this conference and, you know, we're giving a talk on the Great Depression and things like that. And, you know, how, how is it the lessons for today? And he goes, oh, that's actually kind of interesting. And it actually is kind of interesting. And, and then he said, what did he say? He said, oh, yeah, so your, uh, your homeboy Bernanke knows about the Great Depression too, huh? And... <laughs> So first of all, I clarified that he is not my homeboy by any stretch. All right. And, and, the, and the, the cab driver was white, too, by the way. It's not that I just did a horrible uh, accent. I mean, he, he was using the, the lingo. But, um, and so that, and, but I mean, if you think about that, that's amazing that a guy driving a cab in San Francisco not only knows who the chairman of the Federal Reserve is, because I think that's you know, fairly unique and, and, and fairly new, but also he was aware of what his field of specialization was when he was an academic before becoming head of the Fed. Because that's, in case some of you don't know that, that's what he was alluding to, is that it's, it's not merely that, oh, it's a good thing we've got this genius Bernanke at the helm, but Bernanke's um, academic reputation, like if, I don't know if it was his dissertation, but certainly you know, his famous publications, and he has literally books. If you go to Amazon, you can see, I think it came out in 2004, was a collection of Ben Bernanke's essays on the Great Depression, all right? So, I mean, that's uh, fairly odd, isn't it? And, and actually, for those of you who are sort of inclined to conspiracy theories, I mean, that's just a great little thing to work in there that isn't it a coincidence that they have one Fed chair, you know, build up this huge bubble, and just as it's popping, they say, okay, now you take the fall, let's get a new uh, guy in here, and who, who should we put in there? How about somebody who knows how to turn a financial pop into a Great Depression? Yeah, how about you? You want to become Fed chair? I mean, that, so I'm not endorsing that theory. I'm just saying it's a little bit odd that, that that's how it happened. But anyway, it, it is the case that, that Bernanke's specialty was in um, the Great Depression. And, and of course, you know, he was following Milton Friedman's tack and saying that, that what happened back then was that the, the banking system was collapsing and the Fed, you know, sort of at the time in the, in the early 1930s. For various reasons, there, one of the strong Fed governors had died, and so like, they were blaming it on incompetence and bureaucratic infighting and things. And, but, but saying basically the Fed didn't do enough. The Fed sat by and didn't intervene enough, and that's why what should have just been a severe but run-of-the-mill depression with a small d back in the early 1930s festered into the Great Depression because the Fed didn't do enough. They didn't act swiftly and boldly enough. And so that, like I said, that was Bernanke's academic specialty. But, but I think that's amazing that the cab driver knew that. And I think really that that's, that is, someone yelled it out, but I think that is primarily due to Ron Paul and also the, the Mises Institute. And, you know, getting that out that really, if, if you think about it, if you're the, the sort of person that you, you like what the central bank does and you think it's a nice system and you're a, a banker on Wall Street and you're, you know, it, it, people a lot of times, you know, say, you know, well, what's the motivation of these people? And so, well, if somebody gave you a printing press, wouldn't you like that? You know, it's, it's not a bad thing to have a printing press at your disposal. Like it it's, you know, has its perks. And, um, you know, your electric, electric bill goes up and things like that, but you get to print money. It's not too bad. And um, so it, what the Fed had going for all these years was that it was so incredibly boring and complicated. I mean, just to talk about open market operations, when I was a college professor, I dreaded going into class and giving that particular lecture because it's just so boring. I mean, really, it's, it's um, you know, I, I, would, I would dress as a woman just to keep the kids awake for that sort of thing. <laughs> and really, that was the reason I did it, really. <laughs> All right, so, so now, it, like I said, people did not really know who the Fed chair was. I mean, I think... Greenspan, and maybe it's partly Greenspan, well, everything is Greenspan's fault, but maybe this aspect that I'm talking about is also that maybe he was just a bit too flamboyant and, you know, liked the spotlight too much. And was, but I mean, really, if you're 
one of these huge bankers that's, that's profiting from this system of you know, money creation and, and all the new money that comes in the economy filters through the banks first. I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, people say, you know, well, well how, you know, the, who was behind the foundation of the Federal Reserve? Again, if you go back and look, it was, you know, big bankers, connected people on Wall Street. And, and why would they do that? Well, it wasn't merely because they were the most altruistic people saying, I really don't like these boom bust cycles. And, you know, let's do what we can to fix the economy. Another main reason that they were instrumental in that is because the way the Fed gets money into the economy, it goes through the banking sector. And so, you know, if you think about it, you it's a bit of a simplification, but if there's a printing press cranking out new $100 bills, that eventually trickles out through the whole economy and prices in general rise, and there's a new equilibrium after that injection, but certainly it helps to be at the front of the line. And if you get those, that money before somebody else does, who's you know, a widow getting her social security checks, she's gonna be the one that sees prices go up at the grocery store you know, far before any of her income goes up, if it ever does at all. Maybe with inflation adjustments, it, it might, um, cushion the blow a little bit. But so you see, if that's the system that's in operation, and it is, and maybe a little later in the talk I'll get more into the mechanics of it, but certainly you want to keep, keep that quiet. You don't want people reading about the Fed. You don't want someone having you know, an audit the Fed bill. That's just not good. You want to keep that stuff quiet. And, and so I think it's amazing that because of all this stuff that's been happening, and I, like again, I, I think it is due to primarily Ron Paul and, and the Mises Institute and people you know, really pushing this, blaming this on Greenspan, that now people are awake to the fact that the Fed is doing these things and that it's even a possibility that maybe the reason the economy is like this is because of something the Fed did, right? That I think before it wouldn't even have been on people's radar. So, so I think that's a, an encouraging sign. Another encouraging sign, and partly I'm doing this, I want to give you some hope for optimism because the rest of my talk is really going to be depressing. Um, <laughs> part of the, the, uh, the, the like I said, the, the, the cause for optimism here is I've been writing for Mises.org for, I don't know, six or seven years probably. And before, I would get f fan mail, and, and, and incidentally, you know, Tom DiLorenzo said the reason he went into Austrian economics was because it, it studied the real world. The reason I went into it was for the girls, right? That, <laughs> I mean, seriously. Okay. So, but no, you, you actually do get fan mail. It, it was, th this is true too. I, I did a book signing in Nashville, and and so my wife came and some of her friends came who had, you know, they, they knew, oh yeah, Rachel's husband's an economist, that's my wife's name, is an economist, and, but they didn't really know much about me. And then there was a guy who showed up and, and he introduced himself to me, and I'm signing books, and, and he said, hey, can I buy you dinner? And they were going out too, and I said, well, you know, do you want to go with my wife and her friends? He's sure. And he introduces himself to the group as, yeah, I'm one of, uh, you know, the Bob Murphy groupies. And then it was funny, and then afterward, my wife told me that, yeah, my friend asked me, she said, Bob has groupies? And... <laughs> So yes, kids you, at home, you too, if you go into Austrian economics, can have uh, groupies. Okay, but whatever, this is taking me a real long time to make my point. All right. The, my point is that back when I first started doing this st stuff, when I was in grad school writing these articles on Mises.org, I would get fan mail from college students, you know, saying, oh yeah, my professor loves Austrian economics, he made me read Hayek, and this is great stuff, and I had a question about whatever. And... Um, but now the email I get is largely, or at least a big portion of it, is from somebody saying, hey, you know, I'm a fund manager at this company, and, and I'm really worried about which way the dollar's going. I just want to bounce some ideas off your head. You know, that kind of thing that it's, it's regular, real people who actually are in the financial sector, whereas before it was just people, you know, it, we were just like a, a hobby for people, and now it's not a hobby anymore, that really this is, this is serious. And uh, the, I guess the last cause, point on terms of optimism that I'll share before then you know, getting into the bad news is that uh, we really have, and I say that we because, I, like I say, I think it's the, the efforts of people like the Mises Institute, Ron Paul in particular, have gotten out the theory that maybe the reason we had this housing boom and crash was the Fed, that that now is a serious contender, and it's, not, it's no longer just, oh, the Austrians say this, but we all know how crazy those guys are that it, this is, you know, regular mainstream commentators are now saying that, yeah, in retrospect, we think Alan Greenspan maybe provided a little bit too much liquidity. You know, back, back during the housing boom years, he should have raised rates earlier, he shouldn't have brought them down so low in the first place, that you will see mainstream economists talking like that. And so that's a very encouraging sign. More than you saw people talking about that for the dot-com, uh, you know, boom and bust. Like the Austrians, we thought, look, at it, it's so obvious that that's what happened there. But a lot of you know, economists wouldn't have subscribed to that theory at the time. But now, like I say, it's certainly you're not 
some lunatic fringe group if you say, I think the reason we had the housing boom was because of Alan Greenspan. Um, as, as Tom alluded to, the, I mean, the other explanation is that, oh, those Chinese people were saving too much. And I think most normal people realize that sounds kind of like an odd explanation, right? Especially, especially if you delve into the numbers and you see that the saving, the, how can I put it? The, the savings rate of Asian country, or of, excuse me, the global savings rates was higher before the housing boom than at the peak of the housing boom, right? And then, you know, there were times when it was earlier. And then the global savings rate kept going up throughout the housing boom year. So even you know, as housing went up, it's true, global savings rates were increasing. And then housing crashed, and global savings rates kept going up. So in terms of you know, just raw empiricism and trying to fit two curves together, it doesn't really work at all. And so in addition to sort of the theoretical problems of you know, why is it that if people are becoming more frugal in Asia, that's going to make you know, our economy blow up. All right, so th that's what they're saying. OK, so let me uh, try to give you a run through some things here. I think, again, let me sort of try to tie in. We were all, we've all been touching on this, but in case some of you have never really heard this, let me try to encapsulate the, the Austrian theory of you know, where does a business cycle come from. And here, even a lot of ostensibly free market economists will say things like, hey, you know, boom, booms and busts are a normal feature of market economies, and the government should just keep its hands off. It's true the government should keep its hands off, but it's not true that the boom-bust cycle is a normal part of markets. That if you just think about it, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of odd that the economy would go way up and then crash way down and just keep doing that. Like, that's not, uh, it does, you wouldn't think that would be a normal part of markets, or you think that, you know, gee, after that happens five times, wouldn't the people in the markets start to see the pattern and take steps to protect themselves from it? And the answer is they, no, they would normally, except you've got this non-market player in there, the, namely the central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve. And the Fed does everything that it can when it doesn't like the direction the market's going to counteract that. And so that's, that's the, the Austrian view as to, to where these business cycles come from in the first place. All, and then we do agree with most every other normal free market economist who then says, and then during the recession, you know, you don't want to do all these other government interventions. But, but the Austrians are fairly unique in saying the, the boom-bust cycle itself is because of government intervention, that that's not a market outcome. So uh, let me just very briefly remind you that prices serve a function in a market economy. They, however you want to describe it, they communicate information, they help us coordinate our behavior with each other. Just to give you two quick examples, um, Hayek used to talk about the way he would illustrate it. He'd say, you know, look, suppose that there's a, a tin mine in some you know, foreign country in Africa somewhere, let's say, and you know, the mine collapses, and so that means there's going to be less tin coming onto the market over the next six months than otherwise would have been the case if they hadn't been for this mine collapse. And so what needs to happen? And so clearly, if there's less tin be being available. You need businesses to cut back on how much tin they use in their operations. So, you know, so businesses right now that are using it, there's just not enough tin to go around. And so somebody has to cut back, or they all have to cut back a little bit. That's just a physical requirement of what happened. And so in a market economy, what happens is, of course, the price of tin goes up. Speculators might see, you know, read the news or, or people on the inside know that that happened. And so the price of tin is going to shoot up almost immediately. And that's what gets everyone who is a, an industrial consumer of tin to scale back. right? And so Hayek's point is that uh, what market prices do is sort of you know, take the relevant information. In other words, the people around the world who need to cut back to economize on tin, they don't need to know why. They don't have to know the specifics of what happened to that mine. That's irrelevant. For their purposes, in order to you know, effect the necessary change, the response to this, this new uh, condition, all they need to know is tin is now more scarce than it was yesterday. And again, that when you say, well, what, what do you mean by scarce? I mean, that what we mean is, well, what's the new market price of tin? That's what we mean. And so it's that market prices, it's, it's not merely that they reflect something or that they're a signal, but actually that's a, a new type of information that when we, as economists, when we say that something is scarce, that, you know, that tin is, is more scarce than uh, you know, a, a bottle of water, that a, a pound of tin is scarce than a bottle of water. You say, well, what does that mean? I mean, really what it means is it has a higher market price, right? That, that you know, there's various things you could say about that, but really what you mean is that it's got a higher market price. So anyway, that's, um, well, that's one way to see it, that the price there communicates information. And so if the government 
were to come in and say, well, gee, that's not fair. You know, it's just if there's some operation here that relies on tin, it's not fair to them to see their cost of production go up. They might have to lay off workers and scale back their output and the price of whatever it is they produce using tin and other resources is going to go up for consumers. So let's just pass a law making it illegal for the, the, the tin miners to raise uh, their prices. Well, then that's going to cause a problem. Right? That it's going to screw things up. It's going to prevent the market from reacting to that. You're not doing anybody a favor by preventing that information from getting out. I mean, it's like when the government messes with prices, it's really equivalent to them after a natural disaster cutting all the phone lines and, and turning off email and, and not allowing you know, the uh, CBs to be used. Right? And clearly, that's going to make it hard for rescue teams to come in and coordinate the response if all of a sudden all means of communication get shut off. And it's an analogous thing when there's an economic disaster or crisis that prices need to adjust to tell people this is the new reality, adjust your behavior, that that's what market prices do. And so what's happened here with this crisis is the government has done everything in its power to prevent market prices from telling people this is the new situation, right? That we had this huge boom bust cycle in, in the housing market, the most recent crisis, and also in Wall Street, that there were huge profits being earned on Wall Street that clearly were not reflective of, of the true value those people were providing. Right? That a lot of that was, was phony profits, and, and they were actually putting their companies in serious jeopardy, but at the time they were getting big bonuses. And so you know, there's, there's numerous ways of describing the mistakes that were made, but just from an individual household point of view, they thought they had much more uh, wealth than, the, than they than they really did, right? If your home price is rising at double digit rates year after year, you're gonna save less out of your paycheck because, and that's rational. If, if that home price appreciation were legitimate, if it were gonna be sustainable and not just get erased in a few years time, that makes sense. You, you should save less out of your paycheck than you otherwise would have if your house is appreciating, right? That if, uh, I don't know, if, if some movie star for some reason buys the house next to yours and moves in, and that all of a sudden makes your house go up five times in its, in its market value, and you, and you think that the movie star is going to stay there and that he's not going to be real obnoxious and that the people are going to want to, to live next to the movie star, and so your house, its price appreciation is real, then, yeah, you probably shouldn't save as much as you otherwise would have. That, that really is an, an, in, an influx of wealth, and so it makes sense for you not to, to take as much out of your paycheck and put it into your retirement account and so on. So that's what people were doing, Americans were doing during the housing boom years, and that partly explains those statistics as we're, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, about how low the savings rate got during those years. I think it actually went negative for a while. And so that was partly what was going on there, that people thought they were wealthier than they were, and so uh, they were misled. So now when the home prices crash, people need to, you know, need to get a slap in the face and realize, whoa, 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 you've been doing something very wrong these last few years you need to start saving a lot more. And the way, one of the ways you get people to do that is interest rates have to go up, right? Or at least interest rates on certain types of uh, securities or, or certain types of loans, right? So, I mean, that's, that's one complication. People talk about the interest rate. There's actually all sorts of interest rates depending on the particular thing that you're talking about. So, I mean, that's, that's just one example where, of course, what did the government, the Federal Reserve do in response to this crisis? They brought interest rates down to practically zero. Right, so which that's just the exact worst thing to do, that now people don't have the incentive to save more, they actually have the incentive to save less. Now, now to their credit, Americans are saving more because they realize this is crazy, you know, we have to replenish and everyone's just so panicked that they want to build up cash reserves and other really liquid forms of, of wealth just because, again, everyone's so uncertain. But my point is, can you imagine how much more people would be saving right now if we had interest rates you know, had, had gone up to you know, 10% or whatever the number would have been, at least for a while. And certainly you would have seen interest rates on, on corporations, you know, the ones that were really in big trouble, you would have seen their interest rates you know, for uh, capital when they were trying to raise money in the private markets for them to continue with their operations. You know, a lot of these places were dependent on turning over very short-term loans and that's how they were running their business. You would have seen the, the interest rates on those uh, types of transactions just go through the roof. And, and so it's to prevent all that from happening that really explains what Bernanke in particular did with all of his unprecedented interventions. And if I could just, uh, that reminds me, I just want to mention that 
a lot of times when, you know, when, I, when I talk to audiences about this stuff and I, and I tell them, look, the stuff they did back in the 30s is the exact same thing they're doing now, and first people don't believe me. And I said, why don't you believe me? The, the media tells you that every single time right now when the government does something new, what do they say? They say, not since the 1930s has the government done this, right? So I'm not making this stuff up. But then you have to just ask the, what they don't say. Then the follow-up question is, well, gee, if the last time they did all these policies, we had a depression for 10 years, why are we doing it again, right? That they're, they're telling you that these are the same policies the last time we did these policies, it, it, was, it went hand in hand with a 10 year depression. So they're, the response they'll give you, of course, the official response is what well, you're, you're confusing cause and effect. That it's only, you know, the politicians love the free market. They hate taking more power and money for themselves. And it's only very reluctantly do they say, well, gee, I guess if you want us to regulate financial sector more, we'll do it. You know, it's, twist my arm, but okay. And, you know, gee, if you want me to hand out $700 billion to the most powerful bankers in the world, okay, I'll, I guess I'll do it, but, you know, I really don't feel right about it. Um, they, so their, their mentality is we sat back, the market blew up on its own, and now we reluctantly come in to save the day, just like during the 30s, you know, FDR loves the free market, and he would have loved to have sat back and been, you know, the, the, uh, a Jeffersonian, but... Herbert Hoover tried that, and look what happened. And so FDR had no choice but to, to uh, raise you know, the, the scope of the government or, or increase the scope of the government. So the, again, as, as Walter Block mentioned, you can't have a controlled experiment in economics. I can't prove to you that that's not true. It's theoretically possible that that's what happened. That the reason, I mean, so it's undeniable empirically that the two times in, in US history when the federal government and the Fed have been this interventionist and activist also happened to be the two worst periods in U.S. economic history. I mean, nobody can argue with, with those statements. But in terms of interpretation, what caused what? Did the, did the Fed become so interventionist because the market really needed a shot in the arm? Or was the shot in the arm really poison? You know, that's a matter of economic theory. But again, I just want to stress to you that how implausible the, the other side's theory is. And I, I use a, a medical analogy that if you had uh, a certain medical clinic and they specialize in some certain illness and time after time people would come in and they would, they would give a certain uh, you know, pill to these people and say, this is what you do for that illness. Okay, here, those are your symptoms. Here you go. This is the pill. And that throughout history, since that clinic has been open, using that standby original uh, classical medicine pill, you know, the, the, the recovery times would vary. You know, maybe sometimes it would, they'd be, the person would be better in six days. Maybe sometimes it would take the person 18 days to recover, but you know, always the person ended up okay, and that, that's what happened. And then some new doctor comes in, and he says, you know, this, pill is, this isn't a very good pill. I had this new pill that I've designed, and the first patient that comes in with the same symptoms, he gives them the new pill, and then that patient is sicker five times longer than any previous patient has been. And then that doctor says, it's a good thing I showed up with that new pill, because can you imagine how long that guy would have been sick if we'd been using that stupid old pill, right? And so I don't know if you followed me there, but th that's the idea that isn't it just a coincidence that the one time when they changed what the medicine was to fix a depression, it just so happened to be the worst depression in U.S. history. And that is what happened in the 30s. That, uh, let me, uh, this of course is all spelled out in, in the, uh, the wonderful book out there, The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. But just to, 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 to sum it up for you, the, uh, it, it's, it's not merely that it's a little bit off to say Herbert Hoover uh, was a laissez-faire ideologue. It's completely backwards that Hoover was the most interventionist, uh, with the exception of, of wartime, the most interventionist president in U.S. history to that point. That's true. FDR was more of an interventionist than he was, but FDR was more of an interventionist than anybody ever in terms of U.S. presidents, right? So, I mean, that's, that's not saying much to say Hoover was the lesser interventionist compared to the guy who came after him. I mean, we, they've all talked about these things, so I won't dwell on it too much, but um, just to give you a, two, two examples, a lot of the uh, Keynesians will say that the, um, the, the, the problem of the, of the 1930s, what happened was that the uh, fiscal policies were too low, that, that Herbert Hoover, he didn't spend enough money, right? That he, he was panicked about the deficit. He didn't have the, the wisdom of Keynesian uh, aggregate demand analysis at his disposal at the time, and so in his ignorance, he tried to balance the budget in 1932. And, and that is technically true. He did try to reduce the deficit in 1932. And then they'll say, and then FDR came in, ran bigger deficits, 
the economy started to improve, but then FDR chickened out in 1937. He tried to balance the budget, and then there was this double dip that if you're, if you're familiar, the economy was just awful. It was, it was in free fall from 29 to 33. FDR gets sworn in in March of 33. The economy did recover according at least to the conventional statistics, recovered somewhat, and then it collapsed again in 37, 38. And so the Keynesian explanation has to do with fiscal policy, and they'll, they'll basically say, the big deficits went hand in hand with the recovery, and then the smaller deficits led to collapse. And uh, that, that's actually just, that's really a, a very tenuous case. Just to give you an example, Herbert Hoover in the, the year 1933, the fiscal year 1933, when he allegedly you know, had done all these horrible deficit cutting devices, the deficit that year was I think 4.5% of GDP. And then FDR's first three years when he was supposedly doing a good job running huge deficits, before he chickened out, the deficit averaged, I think, 5.1% of GDP, right? So it's only a difference of 60 basis points in terms of the deficit's size um, as it, compared to the size of the economy, and yet that's supposed to be the difference between 25% unemployment and, and you know, robust recovery, is a, a difference of 60 basis points in the deficit relative to the economy. I mean, that, that just doesn't make sense. That, that can't be right. All right, so I'm, I'm running low on time here. Let me uh, jump ahead. So the, the Austrian explanation is that the Fed, when it lowers interest rates, and it does that by pumping money into the financial sector, that lowers uh, interest rates and it makes longer term investments look more profitable. So Walter talked about this a lot, I won't dwell on it. And what happens is you have resources get re-diverted uh, away from where they should be into sectors like housing and other real long term capital intensive industries. And so then, Eventually, the, the Fed chickens out and it starts raising interest rates back. And if you look at the history of interest rates, you'll see that after the dot-com crash, Greenspan brought interest rates down to 1% by June of 2003. He held them there for a year, and then he started hiking them back up. And it looks like a staircase from June of 2004 onward that every time the Fed met, they would raise rates like 25 or 50 basis points. And so they thought they were being responsible, you know, trying to ease off of this thing and cool this, this booming housing market. But obviously the, the damage was done at that point. There were all these irrevocable fixed investments that had been made in durable goods like housing and so forth. And, and so what happens is the economy needs to adjust to that. Mistakes were made, right? Just like Americans weren't saving enough because they were misled by these phony signals. By the same token, people were rushing into the housing market. And, and some of it is endogenous, meaning that once the Fed set this thing in motion, it sort of took on a life of its own. So I'm not going to deny that, that once home prices were appreciating so quickly, people, regardless of interest rates, were jumping in thinking, well, I don't care what the interest rate is. If, if the price is going to go up 10% year over year, that's a good investment to be in. Plus, you get to live in it, right? That's, a, that's what was so unusual about housing is that it also provided a flow of services in the sense that you could live in it. And so, uh, you know, that was, that was happening, but then once the, the Fed backs up, raises interest rates, and reality reasserts itself, the bubble pops. And so what needs to happen in terms of, you know, forget economics for a minute, just think of it physically or in terms of engineering. Well, you had way too many resources going into housing in the financial sector. Resources need to flow out of there. People who are building homes, they need to stop doing that. They need to do something else. And if, if the economy were centrally planned, it would just take a dictator who, you know, if he had command of all the information, and if socialism really worked, if it were a viable system, what would happen is he would just say, okay, well, we don't need this many people building homes. We don't need this much lumber going there. We don't need, you know, all the cement and so forth to pave the, the cul-de-sacs for these new neighborhoods. We, we have these extra resources. Let's put them somewhere else, and, and we can figure out where they're best used because clearly we don't need more, more houses right now. And that's what would happen. But in an actual market economy, obviously there is no central planner, or at least uh, the, 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 there is one in Washington, but there, there shouldn't be a central planner, I'll put it that way, and that, that doesn't work. What happens the way a market deals with that sort of situation is prices adjust, and you do have a period of idleness. In a labor market, it's called unemployment, that people get laid off, and then they have to go figure out where should I go work now, right? And that's the way in a market you take workers, you know, if, if one sector is bloated with workers and other resources and they need to go elsewhere, market prices affect that change, that, that recovery, that adaptation to the new information. And so when, when people say, you know, to, the, to Austrians, 
geez, well, well, you guys are just so negative. You know, you're, you're against everything. What, what would you have the government do? And, and first of all, that's, I think that's fine. That's a useful service that, you know, if somebody, I wrote an article one time that if, if we're, we're watching, and some guy gets stung by a bee and he's allergic and you can see him start to swell up and, and everyone's panicked, oh no, what do we do? And someone says, okay, I know, here's what we do. Uh, let's, let's take this dirty needle right here, let's jam it into his leg, pull out the blood, put it into his arm and, and inject the blood into his arm and we'll get the blood flowing. That's what we should do. And I think I'm contributing if I say, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think that's gonna help. And if that's all I said, I would be helping that guy. And so by the same token, <laughs> if, if the problem is that you know, there's too many, too many resources in this one sector and that real resources need to adjust and that's the situation we're in, and then somebody says, I know, how about the we'll have politicians borrow $700 billion or $787 billion and we'll spend it on a bunch of projects that are connected to politically powerful groups and that'll get money circulating. So we'll take money from this group of taxpayers and we'll, we'll spend it over here to this group of politically connected people and that's what we'll do. If somebody just says, no, that's not gonna help, that's a contribution to the political discourse right there. But we'll, I'll, go, I'll go beyond that and I'll say, so what, what should the government have done? You know, if, if Ron Paul had won and he called me up and said, hey, can you give me some advice? You know, what, what I've said, well, first of all, massively cut taxes, right? That would be one good thing. Think of it this way, the deficit this fiscal year is gonna be, they revised it downward recently, but it's gonna be, I think, around like $1.6 trillion, right? Just the deficit. And I mean, just to remind you of how huge that number is, I, I ran across this funny thing. It was in, uh, I think, July of 2008. So not this last July, but the previous one, when at that time it was the Bush White House, they came up with their forecast for the fiscal 09 deficit. So fiscal year 09 started last October 1st and goes through this September 30th. And so at the time, they were saying, yeah, we think the next, so at that, that time it was next year's fiscal year deficit, and they said it was gonna be something like $450 billion. And everybody was freaking out, and the, the news article I saw that, like the, the bullet, you know, the extra clicks that you could follow, other stories were saying, you know, Democrats uh, castigate, you know, quote, reckless spending of the Bush administration, and stuff like that. It's, I mean, now, if, if they came out and said, actually the deficit this year is gonna be $450 billion, we'd be throwing a party, right? That would be great if they were only gonna borrow $450 billion. So that much money, they could, given that they were going to have that deficit, instead of spending that all, they could have just lowered tax receipts. And in fact, uh, I was just looking up some numbers. In tax year 2008, the corporate and individual income tax receipts were something like 1.5 or 1.6 trillion. So instead of you know spending all this money or committing it to be spent on stimulus and all these things and the, the TARP and all the other things that are making the deficit so big, they could have just said, "Wow, we're in this big recession." Tell you what, everybody right now, you, you, you know, your employer's been taking money out all, all during 2008 for, the, for your taxes. Tell you what, you can, you can have it all back. How's that? You know, on April 15th, we'll, we'll send you all your money back and, and, act, and any income you earn is gonna be tax exempt right now. I mean, can you, it, 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 it's, it's so inconceivable, like we're not even really taking it seriously, but imagine if they actually did that. That would just be unbelievable in terms of, you know, actually stimulating economic production. And just, you know, if you think about what would have happened, for one thing, unemployment would have dropped like a stone because people would have realized I have a one year window here in which everything I earn is gonna be tax free. And so of course, people would be taking even very temporary jobs just to try to take advantage of that. They wouldn't be holding out for, you know, something that really fits my career. They would, just, they would take any job, all right? And so that would actually, since it would be guided by the market, not by government stimulus, that would actually uh, be productive, that people would be taking short-term things so the market would be steering people saying, well, since you're laid off right now, at least go into this sector or this sector over here. Okay, and then let me just, uh, if I just take a few more minutes, I have five minutes left, uh, she's telling me, let me answer the question a lot of people wanna say, oh, let me mention one thing about the government as well. The other thing too, all those bailouts, they should have just you know, undone them or not done them in the first place. and. You know, people are just horrified when I tell them that, and they say, "Oh, but those firms would have failed." You say, "Exactly. That's what you want to have happen. That you want to have the you know, capitalism is a, a profit and loss system. That everyone likes to focus on the profits, and that hey, you have a, a, a sharp entrepreneur that sees the future, introduces a new product, lowers prices, what have you, and then re gets rewarded for that. And, th and that's true. But the other aspect of that, the other side of the coin, is if the entrepreneur screws up, makes a bad forecast." he or she needs to go out of business eventually. 
And that's the way the market disciplines people, and that's how you ensure that resources don't continually get wasted year after year, is the people that aren't good stewards of the resources, if they misdirect them, then they eventually go out of business and they lose the ability to be able to steer those resources. Whereas right now, the very same, or at least largely the same class of people who didn't, either didn't see the, the bust coming or they knew it was a possibility, but they, were, they figured you know, they, they just miscalculated as to when it was gonna hit, or people who even knew full well it was coming, but they were so politically connected, they knew we make more money you know, during the good time to compensate and plus we're gonna get bailed out. Whatever the motivations, those same people are largely still running the US financial system. And then not only that, but the, the precedent of seeing those bailouts, even the people who normally were prudent, they see now that, well, that, that didn't pay off, right? So if you think of it this way, in the year 2005, there were some investment banks that weren't nearly as leveraged and into mortgage-backed securities and these other so-called toxic assets as some of the big players were. And they were reporting lower earnings those years than these other guys who were just hip deep in this stuff. But the justification should have been and, and would have been at the time, that stuff is really risky. We're gonna stay clear of that, don't worry. We're making less money now, we're making fewer bonuses now, but those guys are gonna blow up and then we're gonna, we're gonna own the market. But that's not what happened because the government came in and rescued those guys. Okay, let me, uh, in the remaining few minutes I have, let me just talk about you know, what, what can individual consumers do? Because obviously it's, it's too late. What the government has done, it's, it's, already, it's already a done deal and they're gonna to continue to do things that are, are really uh, bad. And let me, in, in terms of really depressing, let me just remind you, at this stage in the Bush administration, 9-11 hadn't even happened yet, right? And so think about all the things you didn't like about the Bush administration, and we're not even up to you know, that aspect yet. So uh, you know, the, the best is yet to come, I think. Um, so as far as you know, individuals, what, what can you do? And, and I'm not gonna have time to get into it now, maybe during the, the panel discussion, if someone wants to talk about this, I'm sure. But I do think, large price inflation is on the horizon and the economy is just gonna be in the tank for many years. And you know, the, the two minute, or even one minute, how do, why do I think that as far as the, the inflation I can't get into right now? The answer is because Bernanke pumped in so much money. Uh, but as far as the, why is the economy gonna be so awful? I mean, just imagine all this stuff hadn't happened and just we were a normal, normal economy and then all of a sudden the government decided to partially nationalize the banking sector, to take over car companies to try to take over the electricity uh, and energy sectors with this Waxman, Markey bill, cap and trade, so on. And incidentally, there is so much awful stuff in that bill. It's really, I mean, it's not just a cap and trade bill, and I'm not gonna have time to get into it here, but there's all sorts of regulations. Even if they took that aspect out, it's just a huge power grab of centralizing control over the energy sector. Oh, and they're gonna take over healthcare too, right? So I mean, imagine the government did all that during a normal healthy economy that would be awful, wouldn't it? They would, they would just you know, really ruin the economy for years to come. And they say, okay, now they're doing all that and they're borrowing $1.6 trillion in one year and they're doing it when the economy is on its knees already. Right? And, and then you say, so do you believe in green shoots? No, I do not believe in green shoots. <laughs> all right, so given all that, you know, people say, okay, wh what do we do? Now, I'm, let me just clarify, I'm gonna give you just a very general principles here if, the, if you go ahead and do this and you lose a bunch of money, don't sue me, sue Doug French, right? He's the, he's the one that you wanna sue. Okay, so first of all, obviously you write a big fat check to the Mises Institute. That's a great place to put your money and you know, you're never gonna regret that, that investment. But then you say, okay, well how do I protect the rest of my money that I don't give to the Mises Institute? Um, again, first of all, I think we need to really understand that we are right now, it's like we're in 1931 and at the time, well, more like 1930, I mean, people really were, you know, the stock market was bouncing around and there, it went up and there were plenty of people at the time that said, phew, I'm glad we're, you know, that was awful, but now it's over with. And people were talking like that in, you know, 1930 and even early 31 that they thought this is, you know, this is unusually long, but at least now we, we must be over this thing by now. And I think the same thing here that this talk of green shoots is crazy. So you don't want to be running your finances thinking, you know, honey, we just got to hold on for another six months and then we'll be through this nightmare. No, you won't that this is gonna just be awful at least as far as long as the, the current administration's in power. And I think they're gonna get reelected because you know, FDR managed to get reelected many times. So don't fool yourself and think, well, if the economy's awful, they're gonna lose power. That's not what happened with FDR. And so, so that's one thing. And I think another thing you need to do is, ideally, you wanna have income streams. So you don't wanna be tied to one source. You don't just wanna say, 
well, I, I have a good job right now and I hope I don't get laid off. That you want to have, you know, start getting other sources of income into operation depending on what your skills and proclivities are. That's going to differ from person to person. But certainly you don't want to be reliant on one thing because either that's going to go broke or the government's going to take it over. I mean, you don't know what, what's going to happen. And so I think you want to sort of diversify your human capital if that's the way you want to talk about it. And then also you want to, you know, you don't want to sit, open up a luxury jewelry store right now. Probably not. <laughs> All right. So things like that, that, you know, what you're going to do, you don't want it to be dependent on the economy being in really great shape that you want to, you know, so maybe the, the cl thing I tell people is something like, and, and it, not everyone can do this, of course, but if you were thinking of it anyway, now would be a good time to really think about it seriously is, uh, you know, low income housing. If you were a landlord of low income rental housing, I mean, people have to live somewhere and, you know, they're, even if the economy is awful, you're probably going to be able to keep, uh, you know, that thing fully rented out. And then also that would be good that you ideally, because of this possibility of large price inflation, you want your income streams to be things where once inflation really kicks in, that income goes up right away, that, you don't, that you're not the one waiting years for your income to rise. So the thing with, with uh, rental housing would be, you know, once the contract, or you could write the contract such that this is the case, like every year at the latest or every six months, you know, you can have a cost of living adjustment. And so you as the landlord, you know that, okay, not only do I have this steady flow of income that's going to be there even if times are awful, but if prices start rising at 10% per month, you know, a year from now, then, you know, I at least every six months can readjust this thing, whereas my salary from my job might be stagnant, you know, for at least a year, right? So that, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And again, I can't tell you, you know, everyone ought to produce, you know, watches or something. You know, I mean, any, anything I gave you that was that specific, obviously, we can't all do that. So I'm just saying that that's, I think, the, the, the way you want to be thinking is in terms of, first of all, getting different sources of income and then also try to get things that if price inflation does come, and I think it will, that it, it responds sooner rather than, than later. Right? So on that optimistic note, I will uh, stop. Thank you. Thank you.